everybody to the first official meeting of the Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress. Our purpose today is twofold. We need to vote to adopt our committee rules for the 117th Congress. Uh, then following the vote, we're going to hear from a broad range of experts who are here to prime the intellectual pump, so to speak. They've got some great ideas for modernizing Congress, and I'm hoping you'll have a lot of questions and that we'll all walk away from today's discussion with a better sense of what issues we want to focus on as a committee. We've got a lot of cover today, so um, let's get cooking with voting on the committee rules for the 117th. The chair notes the presence of a quorum, and without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. Pursuant to Title II of HRES 6 and Clause 2A of House Rule 11, if I remember my Roman numerals correctly, uh, it's now in order to adopt the Select Committee's Rules of Procedure as is required by House Rules. A copy of the committee's proposed rules were distributed to each of you 24 hours in advance. The clerk will please designate the resolution laying out the committee rules. Resolution offered by Mr. Kilmer to adopt the rules of the Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress. Without objection, the resolution is considered read and is open for amendment at any point. I now recognize myself for five minutes to briefly address the committee's proposed rules. I promise I will not use all five minutes. Um, when this committee was first established in the 116th Congress, uh, I worked closely with then Vice Chair Tom Graves to draft our committee's operating rules. With an eye toward fairness, uh, the rules reflected our unique structure, particularly our equal partisan split, and were designed to set a good example for other committees. Uh, while the proposed rules were taken up today, keep in place that structure. We've also included language to make official some of the unique practices the committee adopted in the 116th. For example, our proposed rules make, make mixed seating during hearings the norm. That's something we did regularly in the 116th, the positive effect. We got to know each other a lot better and the public got to see civility and bipartisan collaboration in action. But we've also included language to encourage addi additional experimentation with how we structure hearings. Maybe a round table hearing will elicit a better discussion between members and witnesses. We won't know unless we try and I'm all for test driving any approach that might help us do our jobs better. Uh, as in the 116th, this committee will model what it recommends, so everyone should expect us to try new things once in a while. Uh, along the same lines, our proposed rules will allow for extended questioning of witnesses on a bipartisan basis. Democrat and Republican committee members can team up to dig deeper into the substance of witness testimony without the constraints of a ticking clock. Hearings should encourage meaningful discussion and informed debate rather than political grandstanding, and our proposed rules are designed to help us achieve those goals. Finally, we've updated our committee rules to allow for remote proceedings like this one, consistent with House rules. The pandemic has upended how we do our work, but we can still work effectively and efficiently on a virtual basis, and that's what we'll do until we can meet safely in person. Um, I'd like to thank Vice Chair Timmons for his partnership in pulling these rules together, and I will recognize him for any remarks he wishes to make. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be very brief. Um, it's an honor to serve on this committee. I can't tell you how much I enjoyed it last Congress, and I'm just so fortunate to be a part of it this Congress and to even be the re Republican leader. Um, it's just a true blessing. Uh, I've really enjoyed getting to know my colleagues across the aisle and, and build relationships that will enable us to do our job better. Um, this Congress is going to be uh, very important for this committee. Uh, we have a lot of work ahead of us, but I think we have a great team and I look forward to building on the success from last year. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Vice Chair Timmons. Does any member wish to be recognized to discuss the committee's rules of procedure? Okay, uh, are there any amendments to the committee rules? Okay, seeing none, I move that the proposed rules be adopted as the rules of the Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress. All in favor of adopting the rules, say aye and give a thumbs up. Aye. 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 All those opposed to adopting the rules say no and give a thumbs down. Okay, in the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it and the rules are adopted. Uh, pursuant to clause 2A2 of rule 11, again, if I'm remembering my Roman numerals correctly, of the rules of the House of Representatives, the rules of the select committee shall be made publicly available in electronic form and published in the congressional record not later than 60 days after the committee adopts its rules. That is 60 days from today, March 25th, 2021. Without objection, the committee stands as adjourned from this part of the meeting, the organizational meeting. 
Okay, let's uh, let's switch gears now and move on to our discussion with the fixed Congress cohort, or as I affectionately refer to them, the reform industrial complex. Um, you know, the committee is really fortunate to have its own ecosystem of tireless supporters. The cohort uh, has been tremendous uh, thought partners. They've been an invaluable resource to this committee. And as we begin our work for the 117th, I'm hoping that today's session will get us all thinking about the exciting and important work ahead of us. Many of the experts that we'll hear from today have previously served as congressional staff. They have a deep understanding of how this place works and sometimes how it doesn't work. And while they represent a diversity of views, all of them share a common goal of wanting Congress to work better for the American people. I should also note that one of our presenters, Brian Baird, is a colleague who represented Washington's third district from 1999 to 2011. And it's great to have Brian with us today, and I'm really looking forward to his unique perspective on modernization. Because we've got a lot of important topics to cover today and a lot of experts on hand to address these topics, we've, we've struck, uh, uh, structured this listening session a bit differently. So rather than hearing from all of our experts at once, we've divided them into five issue-specific panels. Each of the experts will present brief remarks. We'll stop after each panel to give everyone a chance to ask questions specific to that panel. I'll introduce the topic and the experts as we move through each panel. We'll also take a minute at the beginning of each panel to elevate the experts who are presenting to panelists. That way it's easier for everyone to see who is speaking. So without further delay, let's begin our first panel focused on staff capacity. As we all know, the work of staff is what powers much of this institution, institution, just like members. They are dedicated public servants who are here because they want to do meaningful work for our country. They choose careers on the Hill despite the long hours, the lack of job security, and comparatively lower pay to what they could make in the executive branch and private sector. And Congress is fortunate to attract such talented and hardworking staff. The challenge is keeping them here. And I'm looking forward to hearing what our panelists recommend. And to kick us off, I'd like to first recognize Audrey Henson, the founder of College to Congress, a nonprofit dedicated to creating a more diverse, inclusive, and effective Congress by empowering the next generation of public service. Ms. Henson, you have two minutes to present your remarks. Chair Kilmer, Vice Chair Timmons, and members of the committee. Interns are the staffers of tomorrow. However, they fail to reflect the Americans that they serve. Laws passed that affect communities coast to coast, like healthcare, affordable housing, and food security, are written by a primarily homogenous and socioeconomic affluent staff. Congress has a staffing pipeline problem that limits its ability to be effective and efficient. Imagine you're a first generation low income college student with a passion for serving your community. Resources are slim, and knowledge of the process is limited. You apply to dozens of offices and then get offered the opportunity of a lifetime to intern in Congress. Unfortunately, the pay doesn't make ends meet and you find yourself the only minority in a room full of graduates from elite universities. Your first day is not what you expected from our country's leading institution. There's no training, there's no guidance, and the only lifeline you have is an underpaid staffer with a few more months of experience. You're stumbling through the job, not wholly grasping your duties or responsibilities and missing out on helping the office innovate and work more efficiently because you're bogged down just trying to learn outdated practices. That once dedicated public servant decides there are opportunities to make an impact elsewhere where creativity and innovation are welcomed and diversity is a focus, not a campaign slogan. What's left is an institution that continues to lack diversity. This is the intern and junior staffer experience and why I founded College to Congress. But it doesn't have to be this way. Congress must adapt. I encourage you to consider a standard and formal training and onboarding process. Congress can easily accomplish this by matching interns and staff with internal resources and leveraging external resources like the College to Congress online curriculum. These are the necessary changes to cultivate the most effective and efficient representative body, truly reflective of the American people. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Henson, and totally nailed it on the two minutes. Way to start us off right. Um, next, I'd like to represent, uh, recognize Mario Biovides. Did I pronounce that right? Hopefully. Um, I, th I think I see a nodding head, so I'm in the ballpark maybe. Um, the Director of Policy Initiatives at the National Association of Latino Elected and Appointed Officials Educational Fund. Mr. Biovides, you have two minutes to present your remarks. Chair Kilmer, Vice Chair Timmons, and members of the Select Committee, on behalf of the National Association of Latino Elected and Appointed Officials, NALEO, uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. NALEO is the nation's leading nonprofit organization that facilitates 
the full participation of Latinos in the American political process. We'd like to thank the Select Committee for your innovative and bipartisan work to advance solutions to make Congress more efficient and responsive to the American public. And as you continue your groundbreaking work, we do urge you to continue to make promotion of congressional workforce diversity a top priority. Congressional staff provide indispensable assistance, irreplaceable knowledge that policymakers need to meet their responsibilities. And emerging research provides increasingly conclusive evidence that diverse and inclusive teams make members more effective policymakers. However, Congress has fallen short on inclusivity. Communities of color remain significantly underrepresented in the congressional workforce, and there are even greater disparities in representation in top congressional positions. To help address this gap, we've launched our Staff of Congress initiative, a nonpartisan initiative to increase the number of qualified staffers of color in Congress by offering leadership development opportunities and working with hiring managers to actively consider candidates in an inclusive manner. More than 110 staffers have now participated in Staff of Congress, and approximately 70% of those participants have since been promoted to more senior roles. Aleo also in, uh, continues to support initiatives to increase congressional capacity, including support for the House Office of Diversity and Inclusion. And we commend the Select Committee's support and recommendation to make the House Office of Diversity and Inclusion a permanent office. And we urge you to continue your support for that office. We look forward to working with you to explore additional opportunities to foster inclusive hiring practices throughout Congress and help ensure that diversity and inclusion workforce practices help enhance the effectiveness of members of Congress as leaders and public servants. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Biovides. And uh, next up, we have Zach Graves, who serves as the head of policy at the Lincoln Network. Mr. Graves, you have two minutes to present your remarks. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Kilmer, Vice Timmons, and members of the committee. Uh, my organization see this work entails building up and future proofing our institutions to support continued American leadership and innovation. Since the invention of the World Wide Web in 1989, Congress's policy capacity has atrophied, while scientific and technical issues have become much more important. Congress's lost staff capacity has created a deep institutional rift in the formation and oversight of federal s and policy. This has undermined our national security, global competitiveness, and allowed the unchecked growth of federal bureaucracy. Meanwhile, new demands have shifted existing resources away from policy to constituent work, communications, facilities, security, and other things within the institution of Congress. Congress may be one of the most advised bodies in the world, but it still needs its own experts. Effective s and advice for Congress must fulfill six criteria described by Dr. Peter Blair. It must be authoritative, objective, independent, relevant, useful, and timely. External sources of expertise typically fail in one or more of these dimensions, which makes internal expertise essential for the institution. We think broad investment is needed across different parts of the legislative branch to build up this capacity. This includes strengthening committees, providing more resources for support agencies, and increasing allowances for personal offices. In addition, issues of recruitment, retention, hiring authorities, and this committee can play a key role in rebuilding Congress's technology assessment capability, which used to exist in the former Office of Technology Assessment and is now being reconstructed in GAO's SDAA. I detail this uh, in my written testimony. Uh, but as a starting point to address the broader capacity gaps, particularly for science and tech, we think we need at least a 10% increase in FY22 and a much larger investment in the institution over the long run. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Mr. Graves, uh, for your testimony. Next, we're joined by Alexia Jordan, a fellow at the Center for New American Security. Ms. Jordan, you are recognized for two minutes. Thank you all. Um, today, I want to talk about competent diversity. I research national security issues and every high level report talks about not having enough government talent to fill critical sector jobs. Last year, there were millions of non-traditional, physically impaired minority female graduates, et cetera. And to watch Congress turn away talent while reading reports like these is annoyingly exhausting. If you all struggle to find these young, talented economists and technologists, you can let me know. I'm one of them. I know tons of them. And I remember plenty of us being left out when we could have served in Congress. 
Now we've all heard these crazy stories of wannabe staffers walking around the hill, spending a full days of work trying to get y'all's attention because there isn't a standardized HR or hiring process or how interns had to find someone who knew someone to get them in the door. And that literally is the exclusionary process that decreases diversity. Most Americans don't have time for that. They don't live here and they don't have access. So they're naturally excluded. Moreover, gender and race are not the only markers for diversity. Frankly, I don't want a child that's 20 something trying to advise y'all or me about childcare. I want a mom with kids to help us with childcare legislation. I don't want a Manhattanite trying to inform me about agricultural policies, which means I don't want to hear any more about, you know, diversity being hiring one liberal or one conservative from Harvard, you know, and I also don't want to hear more stories about ageism on the Hill when we need this type of diversity. Um, to get this type of thought and socioeconomic status, I think we really need to talk about 302B funding. Um, they need to be increased so you all can pay these people, like normal people, get a more representative staff and be better elected officials so you all can better do your job and oversee the executive branch. Um, I just really want you all to know that people like us, myself, we are on your side. The Modernization Committee has been friends in this fight and we can really get this done. Let's cut some red tape. Diversity is not a hard problem to solve. Thank you guys. Thank you, Ms. Jordan. Uh, next up, we're joined by Meredith McGahey, Executive Director at Issue One. Ms. McGahey, you are recognized for two minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I wanna commend the committee commend you for your leadership. And I'm glad to see Mr. Timmons stepping up to join and in, in leading the committee and thank all those who've agreed to serve. Uh, this is not the easy work. Sometimes it's not the most glamorous thing, but it's an essential part. So thank you very much for be willing to do this. Um, I'm a longtime advocate and lobbyist. I would say this as an introduction uh, because I think it's very relevant of, of all the different issues that I could have chosen to talk about today. I actually chose to speak about uh, legislative staff and retention. Uh, I've been a registered lobbyist since 1987, and I wanted to focus on this topic because of what I've seen over those many years about what's happening in Congress and the ability of Congress to truly serve the American people. Uh, the member's job is very hard. Um, I don't envy a lot of the work that, that you do. Uh, you usually need to be in many places, at, at the same time, uh, you get stopped in some of the more inconvenient places to be asked questions and be held accountable. That comes with the job. The problem that I see here as someone who's worked with Congress now for almost 40 years is the inability to really retain this legislative staff that are needed to ensure that you members are able to achieve uh, the reason that you ran for office. Um, you know, the, the, the salary scale is low. The management expertise is not usually why most of you ran for office or the staff that you hire are not necessarily people that are the best managers. So I've seen many staff over the years that leave uh, because they either get married or have a kid and they wanna make more money. That's one reason. I have to tell you after all these years, I've seen just about the same number of staff who've left because uh, the management of that office could have been better. And they just want it. It's a, you know, it's a tough lifestyle. It is a public service. So there are things that have been done that I think need to continue. There needs to be a lot of attention paid to how you retain staff. This, from my perspective, is particularly important when it comes to empowering staff to truly understand the substance. So I commend you for the work. And we stand ready to help figure out how to make you guys and I say guys in the generic sense, how to make you more effective members of Congress. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McGahey. And uh, thank you for um, uh, your partnership uh, since the creation of this committee. Uh, our final expert on this panel is Christine Simmons, Vice President of Government Affairs at the Nonpartisan Nonprofit Partnership for Public Service. Ms. Simmons, you are recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Vice Chairman Timmons and members of the Select Committee. The Partnership for Public Service is devoted to helping make the federal government more effective. And we want to thank you for serving on the Select Committee, given the many other demands on your time. You are doing important work. You and your staff are really making a difference. So we encourage you to keep building on the success that you've already established based on the prior work. 
and to keep me moving with forward progress and recommendations that you've already made. Let me turn now to what's next. And in the 117th Congress, the Select Committee can continue to lead by example. Audrey and Alexia gave you specific examples of young staffers who give up on the opportunity for a Hill career or have just determined that the burdens or barriers are too high. Um, as members of the Select Committee and as individual members of Congress, you can make sure that that does not have to happen. And there are things that you can do. Um, first, you can educate your colleagues on why staff capacity matters and support ongoing investment in the tools and the resources available to support staff and engage staff. This includes paid internships and student loan repayment, professional development opportunities, and even the, the central HR hub. Those are things that are gonna make a real difference for so many people. Um, second, the Partnership for Public Service has learned through our best places to work in the federal government rankings that the number one driver, the most important factor in employee engagement is how employees feel about their leaders. And that's where you as members of Congress and leaders in your offices are your own secret weapon. So we would encourage you to share your vision of public service with your staffs. Let them know how you define success from constituent service all the way through to doing the nation's business. Get to know them and invite their ideas and recognize their accomplishments, invest in their professional development and learning. I was privileged to work for members of Congress who did just that and it made my decade of experience on Capitol Hill a very rewarding chapter of my career. So thank you so much for all you're doing and we look forward to supporting you. Thank you, Ms. Simmons. Um, that concludes our first panel. I'd like to open it up now for questions. If uh, any member of the committee has a question for our experts, you can give a wave, wave or use the raise hand function, perhaps your favorite 70s dance move, really any of the options. I don't see anyone waving, so I'm gonna take first uh, question. Oh, I got Ed Perlmutter next. So I, I wanted to ask, and I, I'm not sure if I should uh, direct this to Ms. Henson or Ms. Jordan or Ms. Simmons, but or any of you, but the, so there was a study done by Pay Our Interns that found from April to September of 2019, interns in Congress were 76% white, 6.7% black, 7.9% Latino, 7.9% Asia, Asian Pacific Islander, and 0.03% American Indian or Alaska Native. White students make up only 52% of the national undergraduate student population, but accounted for 76% of paid interns, while Black and Latino students are, are underrepresented. So, you know, I think that there was a thought that paying our interns might uh, be helpful in that, and it may have helped in terms of broadening diversity, but it's clearly not enough. So curious, what steps you think Congress should take to make its internships more attractive to a broader range of candidates, how offices can recruit more diverse interns and make it possible for them to accept those positions. And I see Ms. Henson with her hand up. So why don't I call on you? Yeah, Chairman, thank you for the question. This is a question we often get from our congressional offices that we work with. Um, yes, we did pass intern pay. It has increased every year for the last three years. Unfortunately, it's only about $25,000 per house office. And the way that math ends up shaking out is each office can afford two to three interns. When you're really thinking about how much it costs to live in Washington, D.C., rent alone being, you know, $1,200 to $1,400 with roommates, uh, you, you as members also know this too, uh, it's incredibly expensive. And what we've seen is offices have to kind of choose uh, do we dilute our funds and give each intern, you know, a $500 stipend or a thousand, or do we pick winners and losers and only take two or three interns that we fully pay? Both options aren't really great because you're either not meeting the full need of what it costs to live in DC, or you're losing staff capacity. Interns are fielding the phone calls, they're writing, um, your constituents back. So instead of having 10, now since you wanna pay them all, but you have such limited money to pay them, you only have two or three. So in a way, since we're not giving enough, we've almost made the problem even worse because we've made it so much more competitive and we're seeing favoritism and school alumna preferences really come into play more than they were before. Ms. Jordan, did you wanna take a crack at that too? 
I want to second, third, and fourth everything Audrey just said and put a hyper emphasis on recruiting from non-Ivy League and non-Big Ten schools. Um, I know we're starting to focus more on HBCUs now, which is great, but also um, there's so much outlandish technological technological talent coming out of our community colleges, coming out of our trade associations, and people that aren't exactly college trained, but they have literally the skills that we're looking for for X policy um, things. So, you know, yeah, but second, third, and fourth, everything Audrey just said. Thanks so much. Um, Mr. Perlmutter. Thanks, and I second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth, you know, hiring from someplace other than the Ivy League, but that, we'll not talk about that, Derek. I know that would upset you. Um, the question I have is for Ms. McGahey, that, you know, over the course of my, you know, tenure in the Congress, you know, you see people who are kind of ogres as, uh, you know, members of Congress and they mistreat their staff and others that are just, you know, so great. But have you seen sort of any general trend? I mean, was it better or worse when you started? Is it the same? Um, and I'll just turn it over to you. Well, thank you for that question, Mr. Perlmutter. I, I would say, uh, you know, because the, the Hill is like 535 small businesses uh, with very uh, limited rules that cover all, it really is uh, a box of chocolates, as, as, as some of you may understand the reference. Um, you know, every office is a little different. And I think what I've seen, at least from the time when I arrived on the Hill in the early 1980s, is uh, it was just let the members do what they do. The good news is, there is more training available. Uh, there's a staff academy, but you know, there's the, the gap I see is that while I think members are actually more cognizant of what's going on, they understand the intern pipeline that was just referred to, it's some of these other folks, uh, you know, that are the management levels right below, the chiefs of staff, the committee di the directors, those folks that can actually make or break whether or not you keep somebody on staff. Most members realize, I think, in this day and age, that any tirade they go on, uh, you know, and their staff or whatever is likely to make it onto at least social media. So I do think I've seen that change. Members are much more aware. What you don't see is uh, really a skill set of managers. There's not an incentive for enough members to buy, to bring onto their staff, not just political brains, but chiefs of staff and LD who are really good at the managing part of that. And I think that is still a gap. Are there any other questions for this panel? I want to acknowledge on that last point. I mean, uh, in the rule that established this committee, and I think it was largely because um, Mr. Perlmutter asked for it, uh, there is included a reference to enhancing professional development within the Congress. And Meredith, to your point, I think that should apply to members, right? I mean, I, I've, I've uh, you know, when you become a committee chair, ideally there would be some semblance of here's how to be a good committee chair. Or when you're starting an office, if you don't have experience uh, managing and some members don't, um, having some uh, opportunity, you know, for a member academy for, you know, what are best practices for managing a team. I think that's an area where this committee could could um, do some work and, uh, and hopefully make some improvement. You know, I would just add, Mr. Chairman, while many members that come in do have private sector uh, experience in terms of running teams or managing, it's very different in the public sector. So it's not always translatable for people that come in and say, oh yeah, I managed a lot in the private sector. The incentives are different, the rewards are different. And so I think there needs to be a recognition when members come in that those skill sets are not necessarily replicable. Very good. Uh, Mr. Cleaver, and then we'll move on to our next panel. Go ahead. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, when when Ike Skelton, uh, some of the, the newer members won't probably won't, won't remember him, but when Ike Skelton, longtime chair of Armed Services, was training me, after he had lied to me to get me to run, and then uh, uh, had me sitting in his driving to Lexington, Missouri, to sit in his family room as he lectured me on what to, on what you know how to to, to be a member of Congress. He, he used to say to, to me all the time, uh, you know, with his tongue in his cheek, don't treat your staff well because they'll never leave. He says, you got to be mean to them. 
uh, you know, deny them the opportunity to eat lunch, do everything you can to get them uh, not to stay because if they stay, they're gonna eat up all your, your salary. He would say that in, as uh, Bob Hagedorn, his chief of staff sat there laughing uh, who had been with him for 28 years. Uh, I don't know, uh, Ms. McGee, if you remember those, uh, those guys, but uh, Ike was, just so these young people who don't know who Ike's killed, that, that's not, Ike was just the opposite of that. He's a decent guy. And I, but I redesigned it. I, want, I wonder how you guys uh, 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 feel about what I'm about to say, because uh, this is, I redesigned what Ike said, which was mainly uh, joking, but if you put, provide employees with the exposure and uh, the, the knowledge about the mechanics of government so they can get great jobs in the private sector, but treat them and pay them so decently that they don't want to go. Does that, does that fit? Absolutely. Look, there is a brain drain problem in Congress. And I can tell you as a lobbyist, that uh, when you have young staffers who are great and brilliant and wonderful, but have been there all of about five minutes, any lobbyist worth their salt can run circles around them. So I yes. know sometimes where you put the comma, right, Congressman? Where you put the comma matters. When you've been there for about four or five years, you know some about the subject, you don't know that. So you're absolutely right, Congressman. This is an investment for the public interest, right? This is how you ensure the public is best served and don't have the brain drain. And if I may, I would just add the importance of paying staff well early on too. When I first went from intern to staff, I made $25,000 a year. And I was working for a boss that was anti subsidies and I was having to live off of food stamps and um, you know, free healthcare because I could not afford anything else. We see that thousands of times over with the students we serve. They really do want to work in public service and they want to be there for the right reasons. Sometimes they just cannot afford to work in public service. If, um, if there are no further questions, we'll proceed to the next panel. I want to thank all of our experts on this first panel for sharing their wisdom. And I, I know and part of the reason for doing this is so that committee members can call on you in the upcoming months as we dive deeper into these issues of staffing capacity and diversity. So thank you very much. Uh, our second panel is focused on constituent engage engagement, technology, and transparency. Uh, as with staffing, these are issues we began to explore uh, and make recommendations on in the 116th Congress. I'm looking forward to hearing these experts discuss how we can build on that foundation. And our first, first panelist is Kathy Goldschmidt, the Director of Strategic Initiatives at the Congressional Management Foundation. Ms. Goldschmidt, you are now recognized for two minutes. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chairman, and members of the Select Committee, on behalf of the Congressional Management Foundation, I want to thank you for inviting me to testify today. My focus is on how members of Congress engage with constituents and the potential for significant improvements. CMF believes that the communication, current communications between members of Congress and their constituents are failing us. Congress is inundated with emails and calls and is not adequately staffed to handle the onslaught of communication. As a result, the people don't feel heard by Congress, nor do they feel that Congress is responsive to them. Trust is the cornerstone of democracy, and it's impossible to build trust without good communication. This summer, CMF will release the third in our series of reports on the future of citizen engagement, and I'd like to give the committee a sneak preview today. The report will propose a set of principles for constituent engagement, which aims to enhance the capacity of Congress to incorporate the people's voices throughout its work with this overall objective of building greater trust. If you will, picture a system where Congress receives robust engagement from informed and interested constituents, where those who are typically disengaged are included, where every engagement builds trust in members of Congress and legitimacy in governance, where staff spend less time on the administrative tasks of responding to advocacy campaigns and more time understanding constituent needs and responding to them through public policy and oversight. We believe this committee can be a catalyst for this new system and a new era of democracy, and the Congressional Management Foundation looks forward to being a partner in that effort. Thank you. 
Thanks so much, Ms. Goldschmidt. Uh, our next expert is Professor Michael Neblo, Director of the Institute for Democratic Engagement and Accountability and the Connecting to Congress Project. Professor Neblo, you are now recognized for two minutes. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Um, over the last 15 years, our institute has worked with dozens of congressional offices to rebuild trust and foster engagement between members and a broader range of their constituents via what we call deliberative town halls. I don't have the time to go into the details, but I do wanna advocate first for the importance of bringing a wider swath of constituents into discussions about policy, and second, for amending rules to more easily allow Congress to leverage the resources of civil society collaborators to help already overwhelmed staff. Deliberative engagement recruits a representative group of constituents, gives them, them an opportunity to learn about issues and engages them in ways that go beyond rehearsing talking points. In our work, we've found that we were able to reach every type of constituent, not just the usual suspects. Citizens were drawn back into constructive politics, becoming more likely to talk about issues with friends and family, to trust their member and government institutions, and four months later, they were 10% more likely to vote. A whopping 95% of participants reported that such sessions were very valuable for our democracy, and 97% said they would like to participate in another. Staff found these events provided important insights about complex issues and used them to inform both messaging and legislation. Bringing new voices in improves the quality and efficiency of policy by incorporating much more lived experience into decision making. It improves equity by reaching people to, who do not have the resources to make their voices heard. And it improves legitimacy by linking policy directly to all the people who have to live under it. We also plan to extend deliberative town halls into high school civics classrooms, developing deliberative habits into newly enfranchised citizens. And deliberative engagement could also be used in an oversight mode to support accountability during and after impl implementation. Congress can obtain these benefits by changing rules to allow offices and committees to collaborate more easily with outside groups, including the organizations testifying today by clarifying the ethics guidelines, franking rules for digital initiatives and funding pilot programs for offices who want to experiment with innovative constituent engagement, who can then share what they learned with the Congress as a whole. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, uh, next up uh, is Dr. Keith Allred, Executive Director of the National Institute for Civil Discourse. Dr. Allred, you are now recognized for two minutes. Chair Kilmer, Vice Chair Timmons, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. I'll focus on how the American people can complement the committee's work by doing their part to support an effective Congress. I'm confident that everyday Americans engage in Congress to support solutions wise enough to attract broad bipartisan support can be particularly powerful. There are three reasons for this confidence. First, everyday Americans agree on policy issues far more than it appears. Low issues polarization among everyday Americans is an untapped asset for addressing the partisan paralysis that plagues Congress. Second, technological advances make it easier for citizens to engage in this way at scale. Third, NICD has had early success with its Common Sense American program uh, deploying today's technology in this way. We've recruited more than 25,000 Americans from across the country and across the political spectrum, not the usual suspects, but everyday Americans that are typically not that involved in, in politics. And we've recruited them through so social media campaigns and, and recruited them at three and a half times the speed and 14% the cost that we had projected. We've had early success on the issue of surprise medical billing. The thousands of members who reviewed a thorough policy brief and weighed in or an important part of passing legislation in December. Now, our members are weighing in on this committee's recommendations. Early results show strong support. Every committee recommendation that we ask about is getting clear majority support. Many recommendations are receiving overwhelming endorsement. For example, three of the several items receiving more than 90% support are first, recommendations to make Congress more effective, efficient, and transparent from chapter one of the committee's final report. Second, conducting freshman orientation in a nonpartisan way. And third, changing the calendar to increase full working days and decrease travel time. 
NICD and the members of our Common Sense American program look forward to sharing the full results with the committee uh, when we have them and doing our part to support an effective Congress. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Allred. The next expert joining us is Beth Simone no uh, Novak, Director of the Governance Lab. Ms. Novak, you are now recognized for two minutes. Thank you so much. As we all know, according to Gallup in 2020, only 13% of people said they trust Congress a great deal or quite a lot. And I would argue that to restore that trust, we need to create more opportunities for people to participate in lawmaking as other legislatures and governments are doing around the world and at the state and local level as well. That participation in lawmaking enabled by technology is what we like to call crowd law. It's the simple but powerful idea that well-designed processes make it possible to obtain high quality information, insight and expertise to improve the quality as well as the legitimacy of lawmaking. And I hope that this year you'll consider devoting some time to examining these participatory lawmaking innovations and their outcomes around the world and also to trying them yourselves. CrowdLaw uses a variety of different methods and tools. It's not one thing. In France, India, and Brazil, these national large Congresses are turning to the public online to help with improving legislation and developing new solutions. In Scotland and France, their legislatures are creating representative citizen assemblies to assist lawmakers. In the capital region of Belgium, every parliamentary committee includes citizens as advisors. This public also includes experts. The German federal government invited global experts from around the world to help improve its draft artificial intelligence policy by putting the draft on a free open source annotation platform. And here in the US, the Federation of American Scientists is crowdsourcing scientific expertise to help with writing questions for hearings. Crowd law practices are even used for oversight. In the UK parliament, they do what they call online evidence checks to crowdsource the scrutinizing of evidence underlying agency policies. Why does it matter? Three quarters of those surveyed by Public Agenda in 2019 said they would participate if they could contribute their skills and expertise. Yet Pew has found that civic engagement is overwhelmingly the province of the white, the wealthy, and the educated. So we hope that in the coming year, you'll look more at these innovations in participatory lawmaking. You'll try them yourselves and we stand ready to help. And for more information, including interviews with politicians who've tried them and survived it, check out congress.crowd.law, kindly funded by Democracy Fund and the Rockefeller Foundation. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Novak. Uh, our next panelist is Professor Kevin Esterling, Director of the Laboratory for Technology Communication and Democracy at the University of California, Riverside. Professor, es uh, Professor Esterling, you are now recognized for two minutes. Uh, thank you so much for this chance to share my views with the committee today. In addition to being a political science professor, I also was chair of the subcommittee on technology and innovation for the APSA task force on congressional reform. Last year, the select committee's final report listed my subcommittee's proposal to establish a house technology working group as a topic for future consideration. I included a short description of this recommendation in my written testimony, and I urge you to make the working group a formal recommendation from your committee for this year. It might come as no surprise that our APSA subcommittee found that the House currently does not make optimal use of technology in its day-to-day -day operations, from simple things like the CRMs many of you use in your offices, uh, to more ambitious uses of remote technology, such as those de uh, described just now by my fellow panelists for, for constituent engagement. The primary barrier, it turns out, is a lack of any central repository of expertise and best practices within the chamber. Unlike other institutions of the size and scale of the House, there is no central information technology office that is responsible for deploying technology across the chamber. Instead, each office, committee, and support agency is essentially on its own to make technology decisions. Our proposed House Technology Working Group would bring together tech-savvy uh, tech members and staff from across the chamber to collaborate and share best practices and would be overseen by a member-led council that could set priorities. Importantly, the working group only would consult and make recommendations, and it would not have the authority to mandate any new technologies. Uh, we believe our recommendation is a practical, simple, and low-cost way to truly modernize Congress, and I hope the select committee makes the House Technology Working Group one of its recommendations for this year. Thanks so much, and I'll be glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Professor. Uh, last but not least, we are joined by Marcy Harris, co-founder of Popbox, a company with a mission to inform and empower people and make government work better for everyone. 
Uh, Ms. Harris, you are now recognized for two minutes. Thanks so much, uh, Chairman Kilmer, Vice Chair Timmons. It's uh, great to be with you, to see the new members of this very special committee. And I congratulate the returning members on the successes of last Congress. We've seen considerable innovations in the House this year. And I actually think the most significant innovation was not the adoption of any specific technology or process, but rather the demonstration that the House can act quickly to keep the metaphorical lights on and the legislative process going even in the face of incredible challenges. In our 2019 recommendations that uh, Kevin Esterling just mentioned, my colleagues on the APSA Congressional Reform Task Force took note of the concept of a pacing problem, that growing gap between the pace of science and technology and the lagging responsiveness of political institutions. We explained that Congress doesn't just have one pacing problem, it has three. The internal pacing problem referring to Congress's need to apply modern technology and processes for its own operations. The interbranch pacing problem uh, describing the increasing gap between Congress's leveraging of data, evidence, and technology vis-a-vis -vis the executive branch, and the external pacing problem, highlighting the ongoing structural and staff capacity challenges that make it difficult for Congress to keep up with society at large. I think it's fair to say that modernization 1.0 focused primarily on the internal pacing problem, addressing the challenges within the, with the internal operations of the House. I would like to suggest that the work of this committee in this Congress should include an expansion of scope to the interbranch and external pacing problems to ensure that Congress is up to the task of overseeing a rapidly modernizing executive branch and exploring innovations in policymaking uh, to maintain pace with a changing society and complex problems uh, that exist. This includes incorporating what we've called side elements, uh, including stakeholders, individuals, data, and evidence in the policymaking process. You've heard some wonderful examples of that from my co-panelists, and I look forward to working with you to make modernization 2.0 a success. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Harris. That concludes our second panel, and I'd like to now open it up for questions. If you have a question for our experts, please give me a wave or use the raise hand function on your screen. Uh, and I see Ms. Williams. Good morning, everybody. Five minutes, yes. Here on the East Coast, it is still morning. Um, so I just have a few questions because I, and I'm guilty of this and I know others are as well, but constituent engagement often captures like the strong partisanship and the people that you are already interacting with. And as technology evolves around constituent engagement, we have to make sure that we're not just reinforcing those loudest voices, but listening to everyone that we're representing. And, but we have to have systems that reward broad participation and real feedback. So I'm wondering what are some of the best practices of designing technology that encourages a broad range of constituents to reach out to their members on kitchen table issues, not just the issues that are getting the, the most attention in the media. Go ahead, Professor, and then, uh, uh, and then Ms. Novak after you. So that's a great question. Thank you for asking it. Um, we've found that the, the biggest impediment to getting beyond the usual suspects is reaching out affirmatively and personally. It's one thing to post something to your Facebook account or to your Twitter feed, um, but reaching directly to constituents who think that many of whom wrongly think that you don't care about what people like them believe and saying, no, really, I wanna hear what you have to say. How does Tuesday at seven sound? Now, it turns out that's increasingly difficult to do um, largely because of people avoiding what they see as spamming. Um, but there are still techniques uh, for, for doing so and working with community organizations um, who can then reach out on your behalf. Uh, to, to get beyond the usual suspects, but you're, you're absolutely right. Um, in our work, we, we actually use random sampling techniques and we realize that's too expensive for individual offices um, to, to typically use, but that's why we advocate for making it easier for civil society groups to help subsidize the work, the, the great work that you are, are doing in representing your constituents. Thanks. I think Ms. Williams struck a nerve here. So we, I, um, I'll go to Ms. Novick and then uh, Ms. Harris. 
Uh, lovely, thank you. So I wanna echo a lot of what Michael said and just reinforce that there are very good experiences both here and abroad with um, techniques for doing exactly what you're talking about. First, as Michael said, there's much experience with creating representative and random samples of citizens. The cost, however, doesn't have to be that high. AARP, for example, depending on the issue, they have their own um, panels already set up and the ability to rapidly and cheaply convene uh, a, all, you know, a representative sample of Americans. We did an engagement with them on uh, people's issues on big health data last year. We got 6,000 participants that represented a cross section of America in a two week period. Um, on Monday, um, uh, we launched a project called Your Education, Your Voice to help us with getting students and parents engaged in education policy making. Uh, we reached out to 200 different community groups on Monday. On uh, this coming Monday, the New Jersey Department of Education is going to launch its own and again, reach out to hundreds of interest groups that they work with in order to help create that more representative sample. As the chair um, in my other capacity, um, I'm the chief innovation officer for the state of New Jersey. And in that capacity, we did something similar where we reached out to many interest groups, didn't cost us anything. And we heard from 4,000 workers about future of work policy in the space again of two weeks. So lots of good examples. Some are technological, a lot are just procedural, but good guidance on how to do it from past practices. Ms. Harris, you want to take a swing at this too? Thank you. Yes, just very quickly. I wanted to share that that last year we actually worked with a researcher to test a new way of engaging constituents that, that we called member-driven engagement. So instead of, of the member kind of being the, the target of all of the incoming across a lot of different topics, the member actually set the topic and opened up uh, for comments from their constituents over uh, a week period. So it actually allowed for asynchronous engagement. You didn't have to show up at you know 6 p.m. on a Tuesday night to actually be a part of, of the discussion. I think there, there's a lot to be said for the members setting a topic, uh, taking input and, and uh, making it clear that, that you're engaging on that topic and then moving on to the next one so that you're able to focus the discussion a bit and let others see what their, their neighbors are hearing and asking about. And Dr. Allred, um, I may ask you to keep it brief, so because I think I saw a question from uh, Representative Phillips. Yeah, just quickly, I, I think it's a really important question, noting that the extremes among us talk louder and longer, uh, and so we miss out where there actually is a lot of agreement among everyday Americans. And that's the point of our Common Sense American program is to provide a low barrier, high hope way for them to engage uh, and from the grassroots level, reaching out to members of Congress to provide that kind of input. Thank you, um, Mr. Phillips. Uh, thank you all uh, for your, your thoughtful perspectives. My, my question is um, best practices around the world. Uh, Beth, I think you mentioned there are some mechanisms in place in, in other countries. Can you speak to anything specific, any of you, relative to crowd law, uh, crowdsourcing ideas? Are there legislative bodies throughout the world that are doing this in, a, in an engaging, meaningful, and productive fashion? Shall I take a quick stab at that first? And what Please. I'll do in the interest of time in order to not uh, to give my colleagues a chance to speak as well is to point you to congress.crowd.law um, and where we showcase what's going on in other countries uh, on video, on audio, in short memos, and above all, again, interviews with the politicians who are actually trying these things, because I think it's important to hear not just from the academics about what we think, but also from people who are in your position about how they do this efficiently in highly partisan environments and make it work. Um, so the best thing I can do, and as I mentioned in my testimony, they're wonderful examples of, you know, France, uh, for example, going out to the public to ask for ideas with how to restore the economy after COVID. Um, India is going out at, again, very large scale to ask people for good ideas. Um, so depending on the stage of lawmaking and what you're trying to do to get people's perspective on what the problem is, or to get their perspective on what to do about that problem or to get their help with drafting. There's some really good examples. Taiwan is often held out as the flagship simply because their process has been honed where 80% of the public engagement processes have actually led to pieces of legislation. So uh, happy to help and to connect offline, but again, congress.crowd.law uh, will give you something to listen to on the ride home. If you're not okay, say it, it's Congress, say it if you would again, Beth, it's Congress. Congress. Dot law. Dot law. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you for asking. 
Ms. Harris, did you want to speak to this question too? Just to say quickly that that I think we are seeing in some other countries in the European Union, Taiwan, and other places where these kinds of uh, processes are being institutionalized. So they're being baked into the law as a requirement of implementation. And that's something that we, we haven't seen yet uh, really in, in the US. We're still at kind of a project-based, dispersed kind of pilot type programs. Uh, so there's a real opportunity to think about how it could be institutionalized. Wonderful, thank you. Oh, uh, Professor Neblo. I'll be super brief and I'd be happy to, to communicate offline on this, but I'm on the scientific advisory board for a large European Union consortium that's trying to organize best practices across um, uh, Europe on, on these. Uh, and so there's a lot of scientific research that's been built and uh, advice on um, how to do it, but uh, I realize we're out of time. I just wanted to float that out there. Happy to communicate offline. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, if there are no further questions of this panel, we'll um, proceed to the next one. I want to thank all of the panelists uh, for sharing their expertise on this. This is something that in the conclusion of our report from the 116th Congress, we acknowledged we need to dig into more. And uh, I think this is absolutely a subject that is ripe for further string pulling. So thank you. And um, please know we are going to use you all as our phone of friends in the upcoming Congress. Um, uh, our third panel is next. It is focused on rules and norms with a particular emphasis on finding ways to encourage bipartisanship and collaboration in Congress. We'll hear first from Dr. Molly Reynolds, a frequent participant in our committee's work, a senior fellow in governance studies at the Brookings Institution, where she studies Congress with an F emphasis on congressional rules and procedure. Dr. Reynolds, you are now recognized for two minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Kilmer, Vice Chair Timmons, members of the committee and staff. I see you back there. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide input as you begin your work in the 117th Congress. I'll focus my comments today on floor procedure as that's an issue on which you offered suggestions for future Congresses to explore at the conclusion of the 116th. Uh, I'll say the contemporary house is faced with a persistent tension. As rules are inherited from one Congress to the next, minority parties use them to make the majority's life difficult and the majority responds by changing them. Uh, if amendment opportunities, for example, are used primarily as signaling devices meant to draw distinctions between the parties and to force members from potentially vulnerable districts to cast what they feel are tough votes, then there's little incentive for the majority party to allow for procedures uh, that continue to put their members in difficult spots. This use of amendments, of the motion to recommit, of other dilatory motions like the motion to adjourn, um, uh, uh, to create politically difficult circumstances occurs because members believe it is in their interest to do so. Uh, creating a process where more members are able to participate substantively requires changing the incentives members face. Changing the rules often simply displaces the goal-seeking behavior from one tactic to another. That said, one proposal I would encourage the committee to continue to explore is prohibiting roll call votes on amendments in the committee of the whole, but allowing members to call a roll call on anything adopted in the committee of the whole after the bill is reported back to the floor. In addition, I would urge you to support efforts to ensure that existing bipartisan processes are preserved. Um, in recent weeks, the suspension of the rules process has faced threats to its functioning as some members have called for recorded votes rather than allowing measures to be dispensed with using voice votes. Finally, as you consider other potential reforms to floor procedure, I would encourage you to be guided by the principle of making the process work as best it can, uh, possibly can, given the current political realities of the moment. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Dr. Reynolds. Our next panelist is also no stranger this, to this committee, Mark Strand, president of the Congressional Institute. Uh, Mr. Strand, you are now recognized for two minutes. Oops, sorry, I think we just muted you. You may have to unmute again. There we go. We uh, good morning, and uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to testify today. Congratulations to the new members here. You've joined a committee that is a model for how others can operate. In the last session of Congress, this committee passed 97 bipartisan recommendations. You showed your colleagues how to work civilly and productively. But now the hard work really begins. Legislatively speaking, Congress is broken. 
More often than not, the real work of putting together important bills isn't done in committee, it's done in the speaker's office. Just a few key members have input, and for the most part, members have shifted from lawmakers to mass communicators. The key to fixing Congress, to improving relationships and restoring stability, is to increase opportunities for all members to legislate. Uh, here are just some key recommendations from my written testimony. One, stop proxy voting. Members of Congress don't need any more excuses to spend less time in Washington. How can you form relationships with your colleagues if you don't see them? Two, limit closed rules. Allow members to offer amendments. No one is guaranteed to win an amendment, but you should have the chance to participate in the legislative process and advocate on behalf of your constituents. Three, strengthen committees to do the hard work of putting together bills and yes, long and challenging markups. That's where the hard work of legislating should be done. Four, restore authorizations and individual appropriation bills. Five, institute biennial budgeting. This common sense reform that removes the federal budget from the campaign cycles and it will hopefully eliminate the threat of government shutdowns. The Congressional Institute has for some time advocated bringing back earmarks to incentivize members to work together and participate in the legislative process. Uh, we applaud your work last Congress and the decision by Congress to reinstitute them. This work, this committee did in the last Congress uh, was exemplary. You've shown that you can come together on important reforms that will help Capitol Hill run better. I encourage you to think big on legislative reforms. Even if Congress doesn't adopt your recommendations right away, you will build a reservoir of future ideas that new Congresses can take up when the time is right. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Strand. And next we'll hear from Pete uh, Weichlein. I hope I got that right. CEO of the Association of Former Members of Congress. Mr. Weichlein, you are now recognized for two minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And of course, my internet connection is shaky and I'm beginning to speak, so I hope I didn't crash in mid-sentence. Um, the four members of Congress Association is a congressionally chartered 501c3. We are completely bipartisan and we unite about 800 former representatives and senators under our umbrella. We are a repository of congressional knowledge, experience, and history. We are an unparalleled resource to you in this committee's work, and we offer unimpeachable bipartisan credentials. We can help identify and amplify common values that the majority of current members can rally around. So let me add to that FTC's unique ability to amplify your work with the public. We can see as an additional public face, especially areas where your own advocacy could be accused of being self-serving. Much of the work that the committee has done already corresponds directly to issues that were raised in FMC's 2019 report, Congress at the Crossroads, where retired members told us they want stronger personal relationships, they are disappointed with leadership that opposes bipartisan efforts, they are frustrated with ideological and political echo chambers, they have little input in legislation, and they feel that their entire experience is divided on partisan and party lines. In response to this, FNC conducts numerous programs aimed at supporting Congress and current members. For example, we are one of the few private organizations that organizes bipartisan COVELs and staff DELs. Another example is we host a monthly virtual convening of district directors across the country. In addition, FNC wants to play a positive role in the professional experience of newly elected members, whether it's through the freshman orientation in 2023 or by offering professional development through mentoring. And this is the point that was raised during the first panel by you, Mr. Chairman. So I applaud this committee for the work that already has been done. And I again offer FMC and its 800 former members as a resource to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Weichlein. And last but not least, we're joined by John Richter, Director of Bipart the Bipartisan Policy Center's Congress Project. Mr. Richter, you are now recognized for two minutes. Uh, thank you, Chair Kilmer, uh, Vice Chair Timmons, members of the committee. The Bipartisan Policy Center has been honored to work with the committee, which was so successful in the last Congress, and we are confident your productivity will be equally impressive in the 117th. There are a number of areas we believe should be priorities for the committee, but with the short time frame, I'll focus on bipartisanship as it is still the primary means for achieving results. As political scientists James Curry and Francis Lee concluded in their four decade study of Congress, American national lawmaking remains a process of bipartisan accommodation. Moreover, the Center for Effective Lawmaking has found a strong relationship between bipartisanship and effectiveness. 
And there is an equally uh, and extremely high uh, correlation between the most effective lawmakers and those who score high on the Luger Center's bipartisanship index. This committee has already advanced some substantial recommendations for improving bipartisanship, and we look forward to working with you to build on them and ensure implementation. Among the most critical are opportunities for bipartisan district visits, as well as bipartisan retreats at various levels. Additional concrete steps to engender relationship and consensus building could include BPC's Commission on Political Reform recommendation that joint party caucuses should be scheduled in both chambers at least once a month to discuss potential areas for legislative cooperation. The committee could also consider physical changes to the Capitol to facilitate more informal bipartisan social interactions between members. For example, creating gathering spaces <clears throat> convenient to the House floor, reserved exclusively for members to be able to privately engage. Similarly, this panel might recommend that other committees take a page from your book and see committee members from opposite parties next to each other in an alternating arrangement rather than Republicans and Democrats sitting together. Again, there are many other areas where there's room for improvement and the ability to provide additional recommendations, which I cover in my written testimony. In all these facets, <clears throat> BPC stands ready as a resource to help you accomplish your goals. Again, thank you for your work and the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Mr. Richter. That concludes our third panel and I'd like to open it up for questions. If any of the members have a question, you can uh, raise your hand and I already see uh, Vice Chair Timmons. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I know that you and I have discussed this before. I think that this is an area that we need to focus on this Congress. Um, there's just, it's it's an easy one to improve on. That's, that's an understatement. But, um, you know, we had a number of recommendations last Congress. Um, we had a, as just referenced, a bipartisan members only space in the Capitol. That's a no brainer. Finding an area where people can get together and um, have a fellowship and get to know one another um, is something that we really need. And I think that's something we can definitely accomplish. Um, I love the idea of a bipartisan members retreat and uh, just creating opportunities to build relationships across the aisle to find things that we agree on instead of focusing on uh, the things that we do not. Um, I, there's no one in Congress I agree with everything on. So uh, we need to find people that we agree with and focus on those, the, those areas. Um, I just hope that this is an area that we can spend a lot of time on this Congress and hopefully we can make uh, progress. I'll open it up to the panel. We've heard some great ideas. What ideas have we not heard yet that uh, will help uh, facilitate better relationship building? Any of the panel members want to take a swing at that? Well, I, I think one of the things that is clear is what you said is that members need to spend time with each other. Uh, you know, and this is the, the retreats are important. Everything else is that when you communicate, you know, right here, we're kind of communicating, but it's two dimensional and it's good because as a substitute, but it's not the replacement for the real thing. Relationships are the most important thing. You know, if you're friends with somebody, you're not going to take a cheap shot on social media. Uh, and if you talk to someone long enough, you'll probably become their friend. So I think that's the retreats are a great idea. Bipartisan retreats are a great idea. I think this idea of a member space where members can fellowship is also an excellent way to do that. Mr. Wecklein, you want to take a swing at that too? Yeah, and I apologize if my connection is horrendous. Um, so I didn't catch the entire question, but um, I echo that personal relationships. I mentioned our 2019 Congress at a Crossroads Report, and that was probably the number one issue that was raised by retiring members the inability to form meaningful personal relationships and really get to know each other as colleagues. And all of your recommendations that are aimed at further that collegiality across the aisle, um, I think it's tremendously important. And uh, Cordell's play a big role in that. Also the ability of members to host each other in their districts play a big role in that because it's, it's an opportunity for members to hear how different questions are about in other parts of the country. Um, and I will also echo that any activity that involves staff on a bipartisan basis and gives staff the opportunity to get to know each other's colleagues across the aisle uh, should be part of the thinking as well. I, I wanted to ask a question of um, Dr. Reynolds. Um, uh, you mentioned the incentives being out of whack. 
And, you know, I, I think this is tricky, right? I mean, I, I came out of a state legislature where every bill was taken up under an open rule. And I, in eight years in the legislature, I can only maybe remember five or six times where that was abused by either the majority or the minority to jam the other side of the aisle for political purposes. You know, I say that with the recognition that um, if that were applied to Congress, that would be laughable, right? That that um, the degree to which uh, political um, jamming would occur would be off the charts. And unfortunately, to your point, it then creates a vicious cycle where the majority then tries to change the rules or do closed rules to limit that. And I've discovered that um, when you disempower the minority, it's um, not unlike my new puppy. Um, you know, if you don't keep her busy constructively, she chews the furniture. And so what, so the incentives are out of whack. Can you give us some examples of things this committee could do to change incentives? It's such a great question. And you're absolutely right that it's incredibly hard to kind of get your, um, your, your head around. Um, I have a, I have a toddler, so I am also sympathetic to the, the idea if you don't keep him busy, he, he chews the, he chews the furniture. Um, what I will say is that one place where I think you can try and make some um, progress is just trying to provide other ways that members can feel uh, like they have a say in the legislative process. So if it is the case, that floor amendments and that those are limited, but that's the only way that members feel like they have the ability to pursue um, their legislative goals, then yes, that's what they're, that they're going to take, they're going to match their incentive with the tool that they have. But are there ways to use committees and um, working committees? Are there ways to kind of um, use uh, more clearly attach credit for members to particular proposals? So this is consistent with the idea of of um, uh, proposing uh, uh, congressionally directed uh, spending, but are there, are there other ways to kind of, again, advance the ability for, for members to feel like they, they are have, a, have input and have a say in what's happening so that they don't take the kind of one or few opportunities they have um, as the one place that they, um, that they can, um, that they can, they can try to achieve these goals because um, that that's the only opportunity available to them. I think we need a combination of political scientists, organizational psychologists and an exorcist. Um, uh, Mr. Phillips. And the exercise. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't ready for that one, Mr. Chair. I, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't let you all know that um, Co-Chair Timmons, Vice Chair Timmons, is the first person I met in Congress, only because we were sitting in front of a fireplace in a hotel lobby right before orientation began as freshmen. Uh, and we shared a glass of wine. Uh, we found it remarkable that we happen to be sitting on the same bench, a Democrat, a Republican from different parts of the country, different life stories. We became fast friends and perhaps even more importantly, our wives became close friends, but it happened by chance and it's not rocket science. Uh, I love what you've all shared. To me, this is the lowest hanging fruit available to us because all it takes is the most simple of intention uh, to get us together, to share our life stories and break bread. It's as simple as that. It is not complicated. It is not expensive. Uh, it is the easiest thing we can do and perhaps the most disappointing thing that didn't happen uh, when we were sworn in. Uh, so I think it's uh, apropos that this would be discussed right now with uh, Mr. Timmons uh, joining you, Mr. Comer, as our uh, chairs of this committee. Uh, and um, to all of you that are inspiring us to do so, uh, nothing is more important. Uh, and I look forward to playing a role and making it happen. So thank you. Thanks very much. Um, seeing no further questions, I think, oh, Mr. Strand, do you wanna um, make a, a final comment and then we'll move on to our next panel. I do wanna say just quickly, you know, the problems of most legislatures are solved by more legislating. You know, if you reward legislative entrepreneurs by letting them do things on the floor, people become legislative entrepreneurs. If you don't let them legislate, they become communicators and, they, and you empower the loud voices instead of the workhorses. <clears throat> so the way for Congress to reward the workhorses is to actually put more stuff on the floor and let them debate it and allow the amendments to take place. Thank you, Mr. Strand. Uh, I really appreciate um, this panel uh, sharing its expertise and ideas with us. 
I know this is yet another topic that our committee will be digging into further. There is a high level of interest among members and we that, intend to use Derek, Yeah, please. I just wanted to say, Mr. Strand just broke my heart as a member of the rules committee. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, that was well, deliberate. <laughs> the, 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 the concern is duly noted. Um, uh, and again, thank you. This will um, clearly be an important conversation in the coming months. So our next panel uh, features experts on congressional oversight uh, here to share some ideas for how we can better uphold this important Article I function. Our first panelist is uh, Jonathan Bidlack, Director of the Governance Program at the R Street Institute. Mr. Bidlack, you are now recognized for two minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Vice Chairman and distinguished members. I very much appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, as mentioned, I'm the head of the governance program at the R Street Institute, a right of center think tank based in Washington, D.C., uh, and director of R Street's fiscal and budget policy project. We're dedicated to improving the way the federal government operates and passionate about making it more responsive to citizens. The independence of this body and the preservation of its identity and functioning is one of the most important challenges facing you all today. The separation between the branches, a concept enshrined in our founding documents, has eroded over time. Today, action is often expected to originate farther down Pennsylvania Avenue with members executing the will of the executive rather than the people they represent. One consequence is that Congress increasingly struggles to exercise oversight over that executive. When Congress yields its tax and spending responsibilities, for example, it leaves an unchecked executive branch that's more likely to abuse power and squander scarce resources. This is true regardless of which party operates, uh, occupies the White House. The value of oversight cannot be overstated. When Congress does not function properly, it cannot carry out its own important work and represent constituents, and it cannot serve as a check on this overreach by other branches. Consider another example. Every year, Congress must pass a budget, but increasingly it has not. The framework for how the government ought to operate is simply left undone. But the finished product is only part of, the bu of a budget's value. Arguably more important is the process of weighing priorities against one another, planning for the future, and ultimately identifying strategies for improving the lives of citizens. If these decisions are rushed through with gamesmanship and emergencies, then this benefit is lost. But the finished product, uh, finished, uh, product is only part of a budget's value. Arguably more important is the process of uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, moreover, by failing to craft and stick to a realistic governing document for the nation's fiscal future, we impede the ability of Congress to exercise its constitutional prerogative to direct and oversee how the executive branch spends the tax dollars. Numerous recommendations made by this committee in the last session of Congress are critically needed. Restoring congressional rulemaking, strengthening budget enforcement, and providing better reporting on the nation's finances are all ideas that are necessary, not just for their own sake, but for the encouragement of deliberative governance. So uh, I encourage you to continue pursuing these ideas and pushing for their implementation. Uh, thank you for your time and look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Um, our next expert is Elise Bean uh, with the Levin Center at Wayne State University. Ms. Bean, you are now recognized for two minutes. Thank you so much for this opportunity to testify. I want to congratulate this committee on your record of bipartisanship, your practicality, and your effectiveness. So thank you so much for this opportunity to be here today. The Levin Center is part of Wayne State University in Detroit, and it was established in honor of Senator Carl Levin, who is known for his bipartisan fact-based uh, congressional oversight investigations. I worked for him for nearly 30 years doing those investigations. Uh, and we are now dedicated to improving oversight by Congress and state legislatures. And why? Because uh, legislative oversight is critical. It's fundamental to a sustainable democracy. Uh, you require good, good government just simply requires good oversight to ensure effective programs, intelligent spending of taxpayer dollars and government responses to evolving conditions, uh, needs and values. And it's also an opportunity for that bipartisan interaction that we've been talking about. When you work together on fact finding is an opportunity for you to communicate with somebody as a fundamentally different worldview and try to reach consensus on what happened and why. Now, you know better than I do all the problems involved with oversight. There's an absence of congressional standards and norms. Uh, we have an executive branch that often defies congressional information requests. We have inexperienced and untrained staff. Uh, there's that five minute rule that everybody has to struggle with during hearings. And of course, there's excessive partisanship. Uh, the, 
the uh, damage that results is that Congress often views Congress in oversight hearings and loses confidence in the ability of Congress to do the big things that you need to do. We offer a number of different reforms in our statement. I'm just gonna mention three. Uh, that five minute uh, limit on asking questions that makes members struggle to get information, even look rude and insensitive, it doesn't have to be that way. You could have larger, uh, longer uh, periods for questioning. There's a whole variety of ways to go about it. And all you have to do is amend house rules to encourage that kind of questioning uh, option. Uh, a second one is joint administrative staff. This is something that you worked on the last Congress. If you ensure the committees hire administrative staff jointly, split their salaries, then you don't have to have two clerks. You can have one clerk and that clerk answers to both parties and it creates a more bipartisan uh, environment. Uh, perhaps our most important recommendation has to do with legal opinions. Right now, the Department of Justice has the Office of Legal Counsel that for decades has been issuing uh, official legal opinions telling the executive branch how they ought to respond to congressional uh, information requests. And even more, they're citing those opinions in court, making Congress look weak when they try to get their information requests enforced. Uh, Last Congress, uh, this committee talked about that, prob uh, that problem and how to deal with it. I would urge you that this Congress to set up an actual bipartisan task force to talk about how do we get official legal opinions from Congress. If you had those official legal opinions, it would educate staff, the courts, and the executive branch about what they ought to do. To restore public confidence in Congress, we need to improve the oversight function. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Bean. Uh, the next panelist is Liz Hempowitz, Director of Public Policy at the Project on Government Oversight. Ms. Hempowitz, you are now recognized for two minutes. Thank you. Uh, I want to start by thanking the committee for its work in the, in the 116th Congress to develop recommendations to make this a more effective and transparent institution. And I respectfully urge you to turn that same attention towards advancing recommendations to improve Congress's capacity to conduct rigorous oversight. Over the last 15 years, POGO has trained thousands of congressional staff, Democrats and Republicans, House and Senate, and from nearly every committee office and many personal offices on the best practices of oversight and investigations. It is through this work that we have witnessed countless successful efforts to undermine robust congressional oversight, particularly from the executive branch. My written testimony details 10 recommendations to combat various aspects of executive branch hostility to oversight, but today I wanna to highlight three. First, I urge you to support efforts to increase transparency at the Department of Justice's Office of Legal Counsel. Uh, this office has been instrumental in advancing legal theories that stifle Congress's efforts to oversee the executive branch, as Elise just mentioned, and it, and it expands executive power, often at the expense of congressional authorities. To make matters worse, it does so without any requirement to even notify Congress or the public that such legal interpretations have been issued, making it very hard to combat them. Second, I urge you to support efforts to close a loophole in the Freedom of Information Act that has allowed executive agencies to treat requests for information from members of Congress as FOIA requests from the public. This policy means members often receive documents that have been subject to redactions that are meant to shield sensitive information from public release, not from congressional overseers. And finally, I urge you to make sure that whistleblowers who work with Congress will be adequately protected from retaliation by supporting both legislative reforms to strengthen whistleblower protection laws and by continuing to invest in the House's Office of the Whistleblower Ombuds. Whistleblowers are well positioned to shine a light on waste, fraud, and abuse and can serve as a tremendous resource to overseers. However, they often do so at great personal and professional cost, and we simply can't continue to expect them to come forward knowing how flawed the system is. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and please know that POGO is ready to assist you in this very important effort. Thank you, Ms. Hempowitz. And finally, we're joined by Soren Dayton, a policy advocate at Protect Democracy. Mr. Dayton, you're now recognized for two minutes. Thank you for inviting me to share Protect Democracy's perspective with the Select Committee. Like many of you, Protect Democracy is concerned that Congress has ceded too much of its power to the executive. When we look across history, we see the American presidency has increasingly unchecked power, and we want to stop that trend. While many will blame the presidency, we believe that the problem is that Congress has not taken care of itself. You have not used the full scope of your legislative powers. You have given away too many of the powers that you do have, 
and you have not given yourself adequate resources to do your job. We believe that strengthening Congress is key to strengthening American democracy. The subject of this panel is oversight. And in the end, oversight comes down to getting information to legislate in the public interest. Does Congress have enough information? Do you have enough information from the executive branch in particular? And what powers will you use to get that information? I wanna highlight four kinds of powers that you have. First, you have self-validating powers for which you do not need the president. You should modernize enforcement of your contempt powers to get more information bypassing the executive. Second, you have powers that derive from your power of the purse. You should demand more information from the executive, especially as part of the budget process. Third, you can condition the power you delegate or share with the executive. Congress should sunset more laws automatically. If the executive isn't forthcoming with information, it won't keep its powers. Finally, you will sometimes need to team up with the judiciary to enforce your power and get information. You should adopt rules and laws to enhance congressional standing and pass the Congressional Subpoena Compliance and Enforcement Act. My written testimony goes into more details and makes additional recommendations. I'm happy to discuss those in the Q&A. Thank you. We look forward to working with you. Thank you, Mr. Dayton. Uh, that concludes our fourth panel, and I'd like to now open it up for questions. If you have a question for our experts, please give a wave or use the hand raise function on your screen. Uh, Mr. Perlmutter. Thanks, and this is, uh, I guess, for Ms. Bean to start with. So I serve on uh, several committees, and, and you're right, that five minute rule really doesn't allow you to do anything except, you know, pass along some message or, you know, ask some prepackaged question. But I also serve on the rules committee where we have no time limits. And I can tell you that's like the opposite problem because it goes on forever and ever and ever. So, I mean, what, what do you see, uh, give me a solution or two that you think helps the five minute rule? Sure. Uh, here are two examples. Uh, when the Senate was having its recent uh, nomination of a Supreme Court justice, they gave each side 30 minutes and they could decide themselves how to divide up that 30 minutes. The House did the same thing in the impeachment proceeding. They gave each side 45 minutes and they could divide it up. They could have a couple people do it. They could include their counsel if they wanted. So it doesn't have to be all or nothing. Uh, there are many other kinds of solutions like that. Thank you. Chair Kilmer has asked me to uh, run the meeting for a second while he uh, handles something. Um, does anyone else have a question? Ms. Bean, I, I'll, I'll do a follow-up. Um, we recently had a hearing in the Financial Services Committee and um, I, I actually was planning to have another one of the members who was uh, not going to be able to ask questions jump on and cede um, his five minutes to me. So I would get an additional five minutes. Are you familiar with, has, do people ever do that in Congress? I've never heard of it happening. People do it all the time and you absolutely can do it even under the current rules, but people, because it's not mentioned in the current rules, people think you can't. So that's another thing to amend the house rules to make it clear that that's allowed and approved of. Um, do you think it would be possible to amend the rules to instead of taking their five minutes essentially give you an additional five minutes so you wouldn't have to bounce around and go back and forth? The chair can do that now in most hearings, but um, it becomes chaotic because then everybody asks for five minutes. So you may want to make an agreement ahead of time. When we did investigative oversight hearings on the Senate side and on the permanent subcommittee on investigations, we regularly gave the chair and the ranking we each get 10 minutes or 15 minutes at the beginning, so you can at least have a coherent beginning to your hearing. That's another possibility. Sure, thank you. Any other questions from the committee? Okay, seeing none, um, uh, thank you to this panel um, for sharing your expertise and for giving us a lot to think about as we look at ways to strengthen our Article I capacity. We'll proceed to our final panel. Our last panel today is focused on continuity of Congress issues, which have of course moved front and center over the past year. Select committee began dig digging into continuity issues last year, but there's still a lot of work to be done. I'm looking forward to hearing what our experts recommend. And our first panelist is Lorelai Kelly, 
who founded the Resilient Democracy Coalition and is based at the Beck Center for Social Impact and Innovation at Georgetown University, where she leads research on modernizing Congress. Ms. Kelly, you are now recognized for two minutes. Sorry, we still have you on mute. Let's see if one more. There we go. Is that better? Okay. Oh, Thank you, you for having. Oh, hi, members of the committee. Good afternoon. Thank you for having us here today. I served for a, a decade staffing national security issues in Congress before I became part of this cohort. I see continuity as a fundamental part of modernization. Um, in October 2019, I co-authored a memo to this committee on congressional continuity in case of disruption, including a pandemic or a catastrophic event. I will submit this memo and other continuity planning documents, along with a promise to follow up if so desired. Safeguarding Congress must be based on a thorough analysis of probable threats and the risks associated with them. The first step in continuity planning should be a list of assets that you can draw on as you grid essential functions and threats for specific scenarios. Congress has recent insights, having carried on through a pandemic and an insurrection. We are practicing continuity right now at this listening session. Let's make sure the last 12 months are documented for continuity reference. I suggest also that you look for help and guidance from the people with deep operational experience in continuity planning, the military and Wall Street. The military plans constantly for continuity because they operate in circumstances where they must assume physical decapitation, that their people are gone or that the infrastructure is going down or both. Banks have enterprise-wide communications architecture and create constant transactional data, kind of like Congress. A primary factor for the survival of Twin Tower businesses after 9-11 was redundant data storage. Indeed, a robust continuity plan must protect not just physical security, but institutional memory. Resilient systems protect themselves so that they can move seamlessly through disruption. The institutional memory of American lawmaking is mission critical data. The expertise and willingness to help with continuity planning in Congress exists nearby or is just a zoom away. Let's get started on this as soon as possible so we aren't ambushed by a failure of imagination. Thanks for having me here today. Thank you, Ms. Kelly. And our next panelist is Mr. Taylor Swift, a policy advisor for Demand Progress. Mr. Swift, you've got two minutes. Thank you, uh, Chair Kilmer, Vice Chair Timmons, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Taylor Swift. I'm a policy advisor at Demand Progress, where I focus on strengthening Congress's capacity, technology, and efficiency. I'm here today to urge the committee to further examine the House's continuity of operations. Congress must be able to adapt and function in all circumstances. To meet its constitutional obligation, Congress must put rules and procedures into place that guarantee its continuity. What does continuity of Congress mean in practice? With respect to the legislative process, continuity of Congress means lawmakers must be able to exercise all of their powers at any time. This requires remote deliberations. Mm -hmm. In emergencies, members must be able to engage in debate, make motions, and vote from wherever they are. The long-term solution cannot be proxy voting, which is the process that was adopted by the House in 2020 and is continued to be utilized today on the House floor. Proxy voting requires an in-person presence for some members, which creates a serious vulnerability. It also places those who are not physically present at a procedural disadvantage. Remote deliberation should also continue to apply to committee proceedings, including those in closed session or on classified matters. Personal and committee office must also continue to be able to work remotely, as must support offices and agencies. We recommend that a remote voting system be built, deployed, and regularly tested so the option is available in extenuating circumstances. House rules and procedures must also be modernized to define when these circumstances are officially acknowledged and terminated and by whom. In addition, the House must be telework ready and must provide electronic analogs to its processes and procedures. It must develop tools that support in-person and remote work, including making it easier for staff to do their jobs wherever they are securely. Examining these issues and creating mechanisms for operations help to ensure that there will be no lapses in continuity of our democracy in the future. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Mr. Swift. Um, and finally, I'm honored to introduce our final panelist today, Congressman Brian Baird, 
Brian represented, represented Washington's third district from 1999 to 2011. He also led post 9-11 efforts in Congress to address continuity of all three branches of government with a special focus on the House. He's here to today to share his significant experience and perspective. And for that, we are most grateful. Congressman Baird, it's good to see you and you are now recognized. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And thanks to my colleagues and friends. Uh, I want you to thank you first for the service on this committee and for the opportunity to speak to you today about matters of the utmost importance, your personal survival and the continued existence and legitimate functioning of the Congress itself. It should be an axiom of responsible leadership that the more important your position, the more essential it is to provide for your own orderly and legitimate replacement. Unfortunately, that's not the practice in Congress, the executive or the judicial branches of our government. If you take nothing else away from my testimony and perhaps from the entire hearing, I hope it will be these two points. First, Congress must ensure that acts of terrorism, assassinations, pandemics, or other calamities cannot alter the political or ideological makeup of the institution and do not prevent the Congress from fulfilling its duties. Second, solutions to ensure continuity must be put in place before they're needed, not after a crisis or tragedy has occurred. Unless preparations are made beforehand, the Congress may be unable to meet to solve problems or may be so altered by events that actions taken under such circumstances would be illegitimate. In response to the attacks of September 11th, an independent bipartisan continuity of government commission studied continuity issues in great detail and concluded that none of the three branches of the federal government has continuity plans that are constitutionally valid and truly practical or resilient. Since then, little has been done to solve the fundamental problems, even as the threats have only worsened. The unpleasant but undeniable reality is this. You could be killed or incapacitated, and possibly in numbers that would prevent the constitutional quorum from, allow, from allowing Congress to do business. What is more, and I hate to say this, even a single untimely death or worse political assassination could swing the balance of power one way or another. This makes each and every one of you vulnerable personally and the Congress susceptible as an institution. It is in your immediate individual interest and that of the Republic for Congress to solve this. There are in fact solutions, but if anybody believes those solutions are unnecessary or already in place, they are profoundly and dangerously mistaken. Many people and organizations stand ready to help and the time to act is now. Thank you for your consideration, and I'll be glad to answer any questions or provide additional information. Thank you, Congressman Baird. That concludes our fifth and final panel, and I'd like to now open it up for questions. If you have a question for our experts, please give me a wave or raise, uh, use the raise hand function on your screen. I see you, Mr. Cleaver, um, and uh, you can get first uh, first question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Baird, you made me feel real uh, uh, very, very, a lot better uh, today I, I got up, didn't feel good, and just listening to you, man, I just I'm ready to get out. <laughs> I'm uh, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but but look, I, I've got a, a, a three three weeks ago, I guess they a guy indicted uh, for uh, planning to hang and hang me and and Steve Cohen, and uh, they wouldn't even let him out of jail. Then there's a guy near Ed Perlmutter, Perlmutter, Ed Perlmutter up in Colorado who uh, threw two Molotov cocktails into my office here. And he's serving, uh, uh, well now it's 15 years at the Supermax up in Colorado with uh, uh, El, El, El Chapo, or whatever his name is from Mexico. The point I'm making is, you, is that you made a good point. I, nobody likes to think uh, about that a lot, but I, I, I I'm one that recognizes the reality of it. Uh, <clears throat> How would you see something like that happen? Do we do we get a select committee that 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 works to put something together, such as the one that's chaired by uh, uh, members Tilmer and, and and Kilmer, Timmons and Kilmer, uh, or uh, you know, do we get an outside group, uh, you know, Republicans and Democrats to put something together? I don't know. I, I do think that we need to do it. I think we need to do it rather quickly. Well, thank you for the question. There is an outside group already uh, reforming. The Continuity of Government Commission was a bipartisan commission. It produced three different volumes, which provide a tremendous baseline from which we can build. But as I mentioned in my testimony, in spite of three extensive uh, volumes and study, 
very little has been done to solve this. I would recommend that Congress establish a bipartisan, bicameral a select committee to address this. And as you said, I think you need to do it right now. And there are solutions available, but you just can't wait till something horrible happens to try to put them in place. And right now, I really hate to say it, but one single assassination yes. could change the balance of power in the Senate. The best way to protect yourself, in my judgment, is to empower members to nominate their own successors who would serve until special elections can be held. That way, an assassination really just ensures that you get replaced with somebody of similar ideology and political persuasion. Nobody wants to think of it, but if we don't think of it, as we've seen, we leave ourselves open. Thank you. Can I, I I'll go ahead, Mr. Perlmutter. Um, well, Brian and I have had this conversation and it really did come up uh, as we entered into the pandemic. Uh, last year and precisely how we would continue to operate, you know, and Mr. Swift, uh, remote operations and, you know, how would a military establishment uh, stay in place? So we talked about a lot of things and there is a, there is a rule in place, but it's not adequate. Uh, I think it's rule 25 that talks about catastrophes and things like that, but it really doesn't get to the point where you know, if, if, if there is a balance of power change or if there's just, if we're just wiped out either because of a virus or a, an attack, uh, we got nothing. And it really has to be addressed in a bipartisan way. That's the only way you can manage it. And uh, we've seen things, two things happen. We've had the virus and we've now had an attack and um, we got to deal with this. So I don't know. I, uh, it's come up, I, I would say to our vice chair, I would, uh, I know you and I are going to be speaking later, but uh, this is something where I really think uh, we've got to address it. It's just, we've, we've had too many uh, samples and examples that, uh, you know, we could bring everything to a halt and goes right to the president. So I, that's just my feeling on this. Has it, can I ask, is anybody crack the code on this? Have any governments that we should look to, state legislatures, foreign governments, put to put in place thoughtful continuity plans that we might be able to, to learn from? Go ahead, Ms. Kelly. Yeah, I've got a couple of emails out um, at National Democratic Institute and International Republican Institute. They work on these kinds of issues in other countries. Um, they do have resources. Also, the um, U.S. Agency for International Development. Uh, the interesting thing is that we fund this kind of work for other countries to be strong and resilient in their democracies, um, but we failed to uh, take care of ourselves in the same way. But yes, this information is out there. As you know, Congress is not a parliament. It's its own unique creature and it will have to have its own unique plan. But uh, this is a system shock the last year and it's a huge moment for opportunity. So thanks for including this issue. I'll look for those resources for you. I'll, I'll keep looking for them. Thank you. Mr. Swift, go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to briefly mention um, remote voting in other states and other nations around the world. Um, there are a slew of states that have implemented uh, remote voting um, on both the Republican and Democratic side. We have states like Arizona, Arkansas, California, Colorado, um, just a lot it, domestically, but then internationally, we also see that the UK House of Commons has a hybrid model where come in and use proxy voting, but then also vote remotely. Um, the same can be said for countries like Brazil, who um, were on the forefront of this um, in the early part of 2020. They put it, they passed a resolution to allow remote voting um, almost immediately, and their continuity provisions uh, worked quite successfully. And, and the key is here. Um, it's, it's the perspective that it's not secure, right? That a lot of people think that there aren't secure ways to do this, but we're seeing success here in the house when it comes to committees. It's just all about security of internet, two-factor authentication, all of these things that I think that would be valuable for the select committee to examine further. I know that there were some great recommendations last Congress, but the technology is available. It's just continuing to push this conversation and allow for things to be discussed so that we can, um, like former member Brian Bear said, uh, put these rules in place before something else happens. 
I want to call on um, Congressman Baird, but um, as I do, Brian, can I, I'm trying to figure out what the holdup is here, right? There seems to be this incredible inertia against engaging on this issue. And, and candidly, I don't know that I entirely get it. I mean, after 9-11, when a plane was headed for the Capitol, you would have thought that would have been a wake-up call for Congress to handle this. You know, now we've seen a wide-scale pandemic. Um, you know, all of these are, are, you know, reminders of the threat. And yet there seems to be this, while there's an appreciation for the need to continue the core democratic functions of our republic, it seems like folks keep acting like nothing bad could happen. So feel free to, to take a swing at the last question, but I, I'd love to just get your sense of what am I missing here? Why, what, what, what's the reticence to engage on this? And is there, are there some tangible steps that we ought to take to, to get to some solutions? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank you for your receptivity to this and Congressman Pullmetter and, and the whole group. You know, when we first started this, it seemed to me as we studied it, the more you study it, the more frightening it becomes. Uh, you just have to say it starkly, none of the three branches have valid mechanisms. The Presidential Succession Act is a mess. The judiciary has no continuity plan at the Supreme Court. And yet if a, con a constitutional crisis arose, say for presidential succession or the legitimacy of congressional action, you'd have no court. Congress, especially the House, because we require special elections to fill vacancies, could be below a quorum requirement for months at a time. And as I mentioned, even a tiny uh, a change in the balance, one side or the other could change the balance of power in the Senate. That's not a situation you want. It's like being a parent and have never thought that if something happens to you, somebody's going to have to take care of your kids. That's just irresponsible. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I I've never worked on anything more important in my entire life with less success. And that's partly because of denial. People don't want to believe they can die. They believe that something must be in place to take care of it. They believe that maybe everyone will do the right thing if there are survivors. Um, they believed for a while that the Congress or the Capitol itself was secure. We know that's not true. But even if the Capitol is secure, as Congressman Cleaver mentioned, we're all vulnerable. On the way to walking to the hill, somebody can take us out. So the denial is profound and the inertial this is how we have always done things. We must never deviate. Well, nuclear weapons, chem bio, pandemics, assassinations are real. And if we don't solve them now, we leave it just like leaving our kids to some orphanage or something. If we're killed as parents, we've got to deal with this. And if we deal with it, we make ourselves safer as individual members of Congress and we make the institution more resilient. And that's our responsibility. Thank you. Okay, uh, if there are no further questions, um, I wanna thank all of our panelists for sharing their expertise on an incredibly important uh, topic that definitely deserves our con uh, continued attention. So thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, as we close things out, I, I wanna thank our terrific staff, Betsy Hawkins for uh, organizing um, our amazing witnesses, uh, Ananda Bhatia, Alyssa Innes, and Michael Massawer for handling all of our uh, details and technology and uh, all of that that helped this um, uh, happen without a hitch today um, with occasional um, Wi-Fi hiccups. Uh, I want to apologize. I'm going to start working on suburban Wi-Fi, uh, suburban broadband issues. Um, given some of my challenges. I uh, also want to just recognize and thank our new staff director, Yuri Beckelman, for his good work in pulling this together. Thanks to everyone for their thoughtful participation in today's meeting. I know that was a lot of information to take in at once, but my hope is that the pre presentations today got us all thinking about how we may want to focus our work this Congress. I think we'll have a lot to talk about at our uh, retreat tomorrow. So thank you again to the Fix Congress cohort. Your uh, partnership and uh, ongoing support has been invaluable and uh, certainly look forward to continu continuing working with all of you in the 117th. So with that, this meeting stands adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, guys.